Good afternoon. Please open your Bibles and turn to Genesis chapter 49, verse 19. <clears throat> As you're turning to Genesis chapter 49, um, let me share to you uh, a story in the uh, true story uh, in the early church, um, the Roman emperor, um, Antoninus Pius, he launched a persecution of Christians in 150 AD. And one of the victims of his persecution was named Polycarp. And Polycarp was a known Christian pastor, uh, a disciple of the Apostle John. Now, um, before he was killed, he was being commanded by the Roman Empire to recant, uh, to revile his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And what he said was, in response to uh, the Roman Empire's charge to him, um, Polycarp said, and I quote, four score and six years, it means 86. So 86 years have I been his servant and he hath done me no wrong. How then can I blaspheme my king who saved me? End quote. And then he was threatened to be fed to wild beasts and then to be burnt alive, but he didn't recant. He was, in fact, stabbed in the heart, and his body was burned at stake uh, six years after, 156 AD under, again, the persecution launch of Antoninus Pius. Now, in the story of Polycarp, it would seem as if the Christian pastor Polycarp was, in fact, defeated, right? But in fact, it was a picture of a believer who has overcome. And we'll learn more about overcoming such trials in life because this is true of every suffering believer. In fact, it was also true even in the life of Jacob. Many of them, many of the people of God in the, in the line of Jacob, in the family, in the covenant community were indeed uh, victims of suffering. They suffered because of their beliefs. But to be specific, we are studying the blessing of Jacob to his sons. And one of his sons received such blessing, a blessing of overcoming. And it was in fact given to his son Gad. And this is about the overcoming of God. And this was his blessing. So we will read Genesis chapter 49, verse 19 in ESV. And afterwards, I'd like to read. It's not that long. So I'd like to read another version. And that is in KJV. Because I think that version, um, I think it's more, it, it shows us specifically what uh, God means about these of the words mentioned by Jacob. So Genesis chapter 49, verse 19 in ESV. Raiders shall raid Gad, but he shall raid at their heels. In KJV, it says, Gad, a troop shall overcome him, but he shall overcome at the last the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our Lord will stand forever. So along with other brothers, Naphtali, Asher, and even Benjamin, Gad, probably I may mispronounce God and Gad. So, ngayon pa lang, pasensya na po. So just like Naphtali, Benjamin, Asher, Gad, Gad had a very short blessing <laughs> given to him. Um, of course, we, there, there, there are word plays here, as you know. The word God may mean a lot of things. Uh, when Leah bore and conceived God, she said, good fortune has come. So God does mean good fortune, but it also means a lot of things. Now, when you study Hebrew, you have to look at the root, and then yung mga, yung mga words na kapareho ng words na yon may mean different things, okay? Specifically, in these words of Jacob, when Jacob gave these, this blessing to God, the, uh, this entire verse 19 consists of words that come from the word God, right? 
In Hebrew, it's like a tongue twisting phrase. God, 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 God. Parang ganon. Yeah. In fact, kung if we're really for kung translate natin siya into English, it's like God will God God, but He will God them back. So that's how it would sound. Okay. Now, when Jacob used the word God, it meant uh, marauding bands or raiders shall attack. That's what it means. Okay. So again, there are word plays and in, in all of these blessings, and yet at the same time, their prophecies, they're, they will happen. Okay? Now, it did happen. In the time of Moses, specifically in Numbers chapter 32, the Gadites were with the Reubenites, and with, there were, they were with a half-tribe of Manasseh. During the tail end of their 40-year journey in the wilderness, before they entered the, 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 uh, the promised land, the Gadites, Reubenites, half-tribe of Manasseh, they requested Moses if they can stay on the east side of the Jordan River rather than being in Canaan with other tribes of Israel. Now, uh, if you read Numbers chapter 32, uh, you, you'll see there at first Moses got angry. He got angry because he assumed that the Gadites and the others won't help the majority of the Israelites as they go and enter and conquer Canaan. So parang, so you're going to relax as we enter the promised land? Is that what's going to happen here? Parang ganun. But of course, the Gadites and the rest promised Moses that they will be teaming up with the other Israelites uh, and they proved trustworthy. Okay? And that was clear. If you read Deuteronomy chapter 33, we read that in the scripture reading. It says that they were righteous. Right? In fact, if you go to Joshua chapter 22, verse 2, Joshua said to them, to the Gadites and to the Reubenites and to the half-tribe of Manasseh, the ones who requested Moses if they can have the east side of the Jordan uh, for, their, for their livestock, to, uh, for their cattle to live there, Joshua said to them, you have kept all that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, and you have obeyed my voice in all that I have commanded you. So the Gadites were, in fact, good people. They were. And we can see that clearly in Jacob's blessing, where the first part of the blessing shows an almost defeated tribe, and then on the second part, we see a victorious tribe. In between the first and the second phrase or line, there's the word but. And we mentioned this in the past sermons, right? The word but. They will be overcome, but they will overcome. And we've mentioned previously that the word but, I would say, is a word of divine interven intervention. Right? Something's happening here, but God will be overcome, but God will overcome them at the last. Remember the word but, Genesis chapter 45, when Joseph was speaking to his brothers, verse 8 of Genesis chapter 45, Joseph said, it was not you who sent me here, but God. Paul in Ephesians chapter 2, right? You were dead in your trespasses and sins, but God made us alive together with Christ. Now going back to the text, it says God, God will be raided, but God will finally overcome them. But God will finally overcome them. They will be overcome, but they will finally overcome these raiders. Something's going to happen to them, but they will be victors at the end. In KJV, it says, at the last, in the end. Now, isn't this the work of the Lord? Right? Isn't this a but God instead of but Gad? Right? That the Gadites were part of the covenant community, and they, are, they were considered a faithful tribe, According to Deuteronomy and to Joshua, hence we can say that ultimately the one who brings them to victory is none other than God. 
Now, isn't this also something that all of us should be reminded of? That in this life, you feel like you'll, you're overcome. In this life, there's a war, there's a battle, and at times we may feel as if we have been defeated. We have been pressed so hard. But God has overcome our enemies for us. My message this afternoon is that we will experience tribulations in life, but the Lord has overcome our enemies for us. We will experience tribulations in life, but the Lord has overcome our enemies for us. This is a great assurance for believers like us who experience trials every single day. And so I have two points for us to, uh, to, to, to learn from this blessing. First is overcoming God. And second, God the overcomer. Overcoming God and then God the overcomer. Let's consider the, the first point, overcoming God. So again, it, in KJV, it says, God, a troop shall overcome him, but he shall overcome at the last. A marauding band, a group of raiders will overcome God. In Hebrew, it meant invade, meaning they were really invaded for a time. This means that they were, in fact, overcome. Take note, the same word is used, right? Raided. They will raid. They were overcome. They shall overcome. The difference is that the timing, it says the, 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 in, in the last phrase, it says at the last, right? But it's the same word, overcome. Invasion. They were invaded for, uh, for a time. They were overcome. They were pressed. They were plundered, put to the ground controlled, conquered, and yes, we can say defeated in that time. Now, this wasn't a case of, say, a troop fought them and they were winning. No, the troop, in fact, won. That's what it's saying here. But at the last, they have overcome. Now, that will eventually happen to Gad because they will live in a place that foreign invaders usually raid. It was prone to invaders where they lived. Now, in 1 Chronicles chapter 5, verse 19, and if you have your Bibles, we'll go to this, and in my second point, we'll go to this again. 1 Chronicles chapter 5, verse 19 It says, so the Gadites together with the Reubenites and the half-tribe of Manasseh, it says, they waged war against the Hagrites. It was said that these were the descendants of uh, Hagar. That's what they said, according to many commentaries. So they waged war against the Hagrites, Jeter, Nafish, and Nodab. And then in verse 20, it says, And when they prevailed over them, the ones who prevailed were the Gadites, Reubenites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh. When they prevailed over them, the Hagrites and all who were with them were given into their hands. For, their, for, their cried, for they cried out to God in the battle, and he granted their urgent plea because they trusted in him. So several pagan nations have invaded the land of Gadites. And this is the first thing we need to learn here, is that they were indeed raided, right? They prevailed, but that presupposed that they were invaded first. They were conquered, okay? They were overcome by these pagan nations. Yes, for a time, but they were still invaded. They experienced pain. They experienced hardships. In fact, I would say even death, right? And that's common. In the, peop the people of God in the Old Testament experienced such trials, 
right? Some because of their own sin, but some also because of the reality that we all lived in this world that is cursed, which is also a reality for all of us, even those who are saved in the Lord Jesus Christ. There will come a time, and I think in our lives, we will experience hardship. It is to be expected, right? To clarify, Christians, though, are not defeated. Christians are not fully overcome. They will experience difficulties. We will experience difficulties, even though we're Christians, many, many, many times. And it will, at times, it will look as if we are defeated. Right? We may spend many hours in the room crying, sobbing, even sulking at times. And we feel as if our souls are so weary. Pagod na pagod na tayo. Kahit kristyano tayo, aabot tayo sa ganon. Right? We will in a sense seemingly overcome by enemies. In fact, at times, some Christians may end up dying. Paul suffered many times. I mean, if you read the book of Acts, he was in prison, book of Philippians, in his letters. Many of the early Christians suffered. You have their polycarp, which we have learned a while ago. Many of the Puritans were also imprisoned. Some of them, in fact, died. I am reminded of Adam's curse. Genesis chapter 3, verse 17. It says, Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. And you shall eat the plants of the field by the sweat of your face. You shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Creation will not cooperate with the people. People will experience pain in this life as you labor to live on this earth. That is the curse. In fact, instead of daily fruitfulness, you'll get thorns and thistles. And you wouldn't like it. And this will be on repeat until the day, it says here, that you return to the dust. So all of us will indeed experience hardships in life. Again, to the point of feeling overcome. Our sin will continue to weary our souls. Satan will continue to accuse you. You keep repeating this sin. Maybe you're not a Christian. That's, that's, such, that's, a, that's a satanic accusation, right? To, to, to let you know that the cross did not have its effect on you. Because you're still sinning. So maybe, right? You don't need to go to church. You don't need to be with the brethren of Christ. It's just, it's, you're, you're, you're the same person. Nothing changed. Satan will continue to tempt you to give up. Satan will continue to, to tempt you with your sin and present it as something so beautiful so delicious, so pleasant in your eyes, you will be known by people if you continue to doing this, the pride of life. Not only that, death will claim you. Death will claim every human being. These enemies will at times hurt us. And as Christians, we may feel as if these enemies have won. Of course, that's a lie. But there's a reality that we will experience hardships. It is a reality that we will suffer. We will be afflicted. That there will be problems left and right. You have all of these things. It is a reality that all of us will experience trials and tribulations in life. There is a common curse 
that all of us, whether a believer or an unbeliever, will experience. But it is different for a believer. Yes, we can be pressed by these things, and yet a believer must go through it. Because the one that we follow went through suffering. In fact, the author of Hebrews was saying that whenever we become weary and whenever we feel down because of whatever we're feeling, whether we are suffering or whether we are going through trials and we think that whatever we're going through, this suffering or tribulation is really eating up or worrying my soul. It's, 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 it's making me downcast. The, he, the author of Hebrews is saying in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 3 to 4, Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resist, resisted to the point of shedding your blood. If you think you're suffering enough, uh, remember Christ. You did not, you're not experiencing the same kind of suffering that Christ has experienced. If you remain sulking due to the suffering that you're going through, remember Christ who suffered and in fact died in obedience to the purposes of God, died because it was it was purposeful. Because it was done to rescue his people from eternity of suffering. Christ assumed the responsibility of being the substitute of his people, dying on that cross so that his people won't experience greater suffering from the wrath of God. But it was a momentary suffering for Christ showed how he has overcome. Christ showed his victory by rising from the dead. This is the true overcomer. And he is God's provision for your forgiveness of sins. You can never overcome such trials in life if you're not in Jesus Christ. If you're not in Christ, you are not made a conqueror. Hence, you're called to repent of your sins and come to faith in him for the salvation of your souls. But if you are in Jesus Christ, expect suffering, expect hardships, expect that the enemies at times will raid us, overcome us, not fully, not finally. You will experience it. You're pressed so hard. Expect such. No, we're not romanticizing suffering. We're not saying, oh, it's good. Find a way to suffer. We're not saying that. But we're saying, you will experience hardships. And have a renewed view of it. Have a renewed view of difficulties and suffering. The Gadites, according to our text, they cried to the Lord. They cried to the Lord. They were overcome, but they knew who to call. Now, what more in our time? When we know better the wonderful plan of the Lord by giving us Christ, if these people in the old covenant cried to the Lord for help, not knowing fully what God will do for the forgiveness of sins, what more for us, for those who have been redeemed by Christ and who we know the full story. I like what Jerry Bridges said in his book, Trusting God, and I quote, All people, believers as well as unbelievers, experience anxiety, frustration, heartache, and disappointment. Some suffer intense physical pain and catastrophic tragedies. But that which should distinguish the suffering of believers from unbelievers is the confidence that our suffering 
is under the control of an all-powerful and all-loving God, end quote. The Gadites knew. They cried to the Lord. They cried to the all-powerful, all-loving God who has control of all things, even when they were overcome by the raiders, even at the time when they were suffering, afflicted, and experiencing trials in their lives. And so a challenge presented to all my brethren in times of trouble, depend on the Lord. Depend on the Lord in times of trouble. Cry out to Him. When was the last time that you sat down and cried out? When was the last time that you went to your room, sat down and prayed to God, knowing that this suffering, what you're going through, is part of the sovereign plan of God. It is part of the beautiful plan of God. That through such you are sanctified. That it is what God uses for you to be more like Christ. What is our first response when we are met with troubles in life? We look for things that don't help us. We look for temporary solutions found probably in material things. We think that we can forget our problems by buying time. And at times, the last thing in our minds is to seek the help of our Lord. D.A. Carson says, and I quote, when we suffer, there will sometimes be mystery. Will there also be faith? Yes, if our attention is focused more on the cross and on the God of the cross than on the suffering itself. End quote. And that's a usual problem, right? That we're, we're, we're focused more on what's happening and not looking beyond what God is doing. That in the mind of God, such trials has been thrown at you so that you can be more like Christ. And that we're so focused, so focused on the hardships. Hindi natin minamaliit ang mga trials sa buhay natin. But we must look beyond it. And we must seek the Lord, cry out, Lord, give me eyes to see what's going on. Give me eyes and ears to hear your word, to remind me of your purpose for such trials. That you love me. That you're giving this to me because you in fact love me. Not because you hate me. Because all your wrath has been poured on Christ already. And because I am in Christ, I will not experience such wrath anymore. And so I will look at such trials that you throw, throw at me as you conforming me to the image of your son. Do you suffer because of your current situation? Do you feel overcome by sin? It's the same sin. Lord, why am I going through the same thing? But be reminded of the cross. Oh, you will be tempted by saying, yes, it's the same. It's the same sin. You're really not saved. See? He continues to tempt you for you to forget what happened on the cross. But your assurance is that Jesus indeed died and Jesus rose again. There's your sin judged on the cross. Do not believe such lies. Do you feel overcome by the enemies of God? Let me remind you, brethren, this is a great opportunity. Expect suffering, but suffer well by coming to God in prayer. Cry out to the Lord. Depend on Him in times of trouble. My last point is God the overcomer. We have learned that God will be conquered 
But again, according to First Chron Chronicles chapter 5, so we'll read that again, chapter 5, verses 18 onwards. It says, They waged war against the Hagrites, Jether, Naphish, and Nodab, and when they prevailed over them, See, they prevailed over them. In its original language, language, it actually meant they were helped. They were supported. Okay? So meaning, it's not in and of themselves. Someone else helped them. In verse 20, this makes it clear, makes it clear to us. In verse 20, it says, And when they prevailed over them, the Hagrites and all who were with them were given into their hands. Someone have, has given these enemies to their hands for destructions. For they cried out to God in the battle and he granted their urgent plea. See, God granted their urgent plea because they trusted in him. This tells us that when Jacob said in our passage, God, a troop shall overcome him, but he shall overcome at the last. It wasn't really God's own strength that led them to victory, to overcoming the enemy. It was God's victory. It was God's doing. I am reminded when David was in a battle with the Philistines in 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 45, when David was, this is what David told the Philistines. You come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of armies of Israel, whom you have defied. And then in verse 47, it says, For the battle is the Lord's and he will give you into our hand. When God's people go into battle, it is ultimately the Lord's battle. When God's people in the new covenant, the church, goes into spiritual battle, it is ultimately the Lord's battle. And it is only God who can win. It is only God who can provide a conqueror who will overcome his enemy, sin, Satan, and death. And the true overcomer has come. And he has indeed overcome these enemies, not by sword, but by his death and resurrection. And because of Christ's victory on the cross, the people he saved will also go through trials, but they are and they will be victorious. That's what we can see. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, when Christ was talking to Peter, when after Peter giving his right confession of who Jesus Christ is, that he was, that he is the Son of God, he is the, the Messiah, Jesus Christ told Peter, and I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock or on the confession that you gave me, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Just as Christ was victor over his enemies, and he has overcome his enemies, also his body, also his bride, the church, is and will be victorious. In this text, the church is not on defense. It says the gates of hell, Christ will build his church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The church is not defending here. It is the church that is in the offense, in the attack. Yes, the church will go through hardships, but the church will prevail against evil. Yes, while we all wait for the return of Christ and in His return, all evil will be gone. But as we wait, evil will still exist. But the church is victorious 
the church will be victorious finally when Christ returns because her Savior won. And we see this attack, right? In the end of the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 28, it's not an attack using a sword. Go and attack. Labas nyo yung mga espada nyo, mga pana, bows and all. Hindi ganon eh. After the resurrection of Christ, Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 to 20, Christ says to his apostles, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe that all that I have commanded you, this is how we will attack. Make disciples. This is how Christ overcomes and he has overcome, go and attack. Go and make disciples, is Christ. That, that's what Christ said. Not only that, he said, as you overcome, as you attack, I am with you always, Christ says. Because ultimately, this is the Lord's battle. This is how we are attacking evil. This is how we are attacking the enemies of God. Make Christ known to all nations. Let the nations know that evil has an end and that Christ was and is victorious. Take note that Matthew chapter 28 is not just a call to preach the victory of Christ. Go and preach. Preach about the, the true overcomer who is victorious over sin, Satan, and death. Go. Well, it's also correct. Yes, it is a call to preach that, but also Matthew chapter 28 is a result of the victory. Christ was not just commanding the church to preach the gospel here or there, but also assuring us and saying, I won. Now go and make disciples. Now you can make disciples. The church will be built because I won. That's the optimism behind the passage. Go and make Christ known. Go and learn Christ. Go and be taught the word of God. Go and be sanctified by his word. Go and tell people of my victory so that those who are suffering will endure because they have heard the message of victory in the gospel. Go and preach this message of victory to those who who were dead in their trespasses and sins so that they will be made alive together with Christ. And so they too will be part of the church, a church that preaches the same message of victory so that whenever they suffer, whenever they experience trials and tribulations, they will be helped. They will prevail over such enemies. Trials and tribulations, in trials and tribulations, they will endure because they've heard the message of victory. Go, therefore, Go to the world. Go to the world. This is God's message to, Christ's message to the apostles. His message of go is saying, okay, now I'm, I'm parang, parang siyang end ng worship, no, go. Now you're, go back to the world, right? Know that you're going back to this cursed world and expect suffering. Go to the world, suffer, experience hardships, but know that God blesses us by preserving us because Christ was victorious on the cross. That is the message that you're carrying. That is the message that you will be preaching to, the, to all the nations so they too, as they experience hardships, they will be sanctified as well, those who are His. It helps during the time of trials when they hear that message of victory. Our trials become providential to us. It helps us in our sanctification. It helps us respond in a way Christ will respond. It helps us be more conformed in His image. Because we are reminded that even when, when we're going through trials, we're reminded that and when we're accused by Satan, tempted by Satan, and we go through hardships and the world presents sin as beautiful and you're your passion, your, 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 your inner self would want to sin, 
and yet you hear the message of the gospel preached to you, and this is the fulfillment of Matthew 28, um, you will think, this is a temporary hardship. This is a temporary uh, affliction because someone has overcome. Even in trials, in fact, Christ is victorious. It's not like, well, well, that is also true, by the way. Whenever there's trials, there's an end to it, and we can look at it and we can view it as, well, Christ is victorious because there's an end to trials. But you also have to see this in this way. Even during the trials, Christ is victorious. Even the most difficult trial you will ever experience in life, we see the victory of Christ there. Even in the worst thing that will happen to you. Now, it is right to think that this worst trial or tribulation that's happening in your life, it has an end to it. And the fact that it has an end, it means that Christ is victorious. That's correct. But also, I want you to, to, to see this this way, that even that worst thing that is happening to you right now, we can see the victory of Christ there. For you go through it to such trials and you're being molded to be like your Lord. Isn't that a result of the victory of Christ? Now, for those who are not in Christ, then such suffering will just end by you being suffer, being, I mean, suffering, it has no end purpose for you other than you're going to be hurt. But as a Christian, you're going to be hurt. You're going to be pressed down, probably feeling conquered, but you're not. In fact, it is for your good. Sin will continue to press us really, really hard, but we have overcome in Christ. And so the challenge for us is to rely on the victory of Christ despite the continuous trials in life. Rely on the victory of Christ despite the continuous trials in life. Let the victory of Christ mortify any pessimisms you have. A Christian who feels defeated by sin is not really defeated. He's tempted to feel defeated. He's accused by Satan of being defeated. But the truth is, in Christ, he is not. 1 John chapter 4, verse 4, Little children, you are... From, see, see the assurance of of the Apostle John. You are little children. You are from God and have overcome them. For he who is in you, and he's talking about Christ, is greater than he who is in the world, the enemy of Christ. Christ has overcome. Trials may at times weaken us to the point of us being so downcast, but it's not the end, brethren. When we go through trials and when we suffer, know that you're going through it having in mind God's sanctification. Know that you're going through it temporarily. And by the way, when I say temporarily, it may mean your lifetime. But it's still temporary. And know that no matter what we go through in this life, May it be the most evil thing. Again, we have an assurance that God has overcome evil. He did so through the death and resurrection of Christ. He has overcome evil on that cross. That whatever evil that may come in our lives, because Christ died on the cross, whatever evil, whatever suffering, hardship that we go through, it now becomes good for us. Remember the most evil thing. Christ, the innocent man, sinless, and yet killed on the cross, and that same death becomes good for us. 
God has overcome evil, that even death becomes good for those who are in Christ. So remember this. When you think you're defeated by sin, remember these things. When you feel that you have been overcome, you're not. It was Christ who has overcome God's enemies. In my introduction, I mentioned Polycarp. Now, I mentioned that he was a Christian pastor. I didn't mention which church. He was the pastor of the church of Smyrna. And you are, I'm sure, aware of the church of Smyrna, especially in Revelation chapter 2. Now, John received these messages from Christ himself many years before the death of Polycarp. So it means that this has been received by Polycarp. Revelation chapter 2, verse 10, this was Christ's message to Smyrna. He said, Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and for ten days you will have tribulation. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. That's exactly what happened to their pastor, Polycarp. Having, receiving this message years before his persecution, before he was put into prison, be, before he was burned at stake, the reason why he had such conviction in his heart, because he knew that Christ told him and his church that they will suffer. But because Christ is victor over his enemies, there is a crown of life waiting for those who are faithful unto death. This is only possible because Christ has overcome evil. If Christ did not come, they will be put into prison for nothing. But Christ has come. You know, when we sing this great song entitled, Yet Not I, But Through Christ in Me, that some, sometimes when we, are, when we are battling this, when we, ha when we are in this spiritual warfare against our own sins, and we sometimes feel as if sin has overcome us, I think this song should remind us also of what I have been talking about this afternoon, that it is a lie for sin to overcome us because, again, it is a battle that has already been won by Christ. I'd like to, um, to quote one of the verses in that song. It says, To this I hold, my shepherd will defend me. Through the deepest valley he will lead. Oh, the night has been won and I shall overcome, yet not I, but through Christ in me. You see that the writer is saying that he shall overcome, but at, at the end, he knew whose battle it is. It is the Lord's, and it is the Lord who has overcome, yet not us, but through Christ in us. Are there difficulties in your life now? Difficulties in your home? in your marriage, in your own spiritual walk? Do you feel defeated? Well, if you are in Christ, and you are, my dear brethren, you are made more than conquerors in Christ. Remember, we will experience tribulations in life, but the Lord has overcome our enemies for us. In times of trouble, depend on the Lord and rely on the victory of Christ despite the continuous trials in life. May the word of God enrich our knowledge of him and may it stir us to live in light of these truths. Let us pray. Our most high God and heavenly Father, we are thankful for the victory of Christ. Lord, apart from Christ, we, Lord, on our own, we can never defeat such enemies. But Lord, in him we are assured that we can go through such hardship 
such tribulations, knowing, O Lord, that in your mind we are continuously being sanctified, knowing also that we are entering such warfare, having in mind Christ's victory. May we remember these things, O Lord, whenever we uh, encounter such tribulations in life. Lord, we thank you for your word today. May this strengthen and comfort us. In the name of Christ, amen.